You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 451. I think that all the anger and cynicism comes from suppressing things that we've always wanted. John Lee Hancock. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Indie Film Hustle's Filmmaker Process. We provide filmmakers with professional services to get their films or series funded, finished, and distributed. Some of the services we offer are pitch deck creation, film budgets and schedules, domestic and international sales estimates, legal contract templates, consulting, post-production services, script coverage, professional trailer editing, poster design, film deliverables, and production payroll. To learn more, go to www.filmmakerprocess.com. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films. From predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them, the odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's film, B-I-Z, book.com. Well, guys, today on the show, we have screenwriter and filmmaker John Lee Hancock. Now, John has made some of the most amazing films over the years, some of my favorite films. He has written, produced, and or directed. The first film that really brought him into Hollywood was when he wrote The Perfect World for Clint Eastwood and starring Clint and Kevin Costner. He then went on to write Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil for Clint Eastwood, produced one of my favorite films of all time, My Dog Skip. Then he had his second directorial debut, which we'll talk about in the, in the episode. Um, but the big movie that kind of launched him as a director was The Rookie, Walt Disney Pictures, The Rookie, starring Dennis Quaid. He went on to write and direct the epic The Alamo and then took a five-year hiatus to come back with The Blind Side, the Oscar-nominated Best Picture starring Sandra Bullock, which, of course, she won the Oscar for that year. He has written and directed films like Saving Mr. Banks, The Founder, The Highwayman, and the latest HBO Max release, The Little Things, starring Oscar winners Denzel Washington, Rami Malik, and Jared Leto. I had a ball talking with John about filmmaking, about how he got his start, how he almost broke Steven Spielberg's rosebud prop from Citizen Kane when they first met, and so much more. John really goes into detail about his creative process, how he was able to navigate Hollywood, how to deal with the highs and lows of the business, and so much more. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with John Lee Hancock. I'd like to welcome to the show John Lee Hancock. How are you doing, John? I'm doing great, Alex. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, I've been a big fan of your stuff for a while, uh, and I um, I reached out to you because I wanted to talk to you about your process and and your and your filmography and how you do stuff because you've done you, you've been able to write some amazing like perfect wor- about the perfect world. I I love that when it came out. I was just like blown away by that and um, and a lot of the other writing you've done, but also um, your directing and how you trans trans um, 
transitioned from screenwriting to directing and, 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 and how you've been able to kind of jump back and forth and stuff. So we're going to get into the weeds a little bit about, uh, about what you do, if you don't mind. No, no, <laughs> ask, ask away. So first, first things first, how did you get into the business? Wow. Like, like most people, uh, it was circuitous and, you know, I, I started off as a lawyer in Houston, Texas, mm -hmm. uh, practiced law for about three years. I'd been writing for a good long while, but started while in Houston, started writing screenplays. And, um, I had a screenplay that got accepted to a Sundance Institute satellite program in Austin, Texas over a weekend or something. And, uh, thought, well, you know, maybe I have enough talent. Somebody thought so. And uh, moved to Los Angeles, did every odd job in town to try to, you know, pay the bills and have time to write. Um, had a theater company. Uh, I wrote and, and directed plays uh, for friends who were actors uh, and just kept writing screenplays. And then, you know, lo and behold, uh, A Perfect World uh, with Clint Eastwood and Kevin Costner got made. And that's kind of, that's, that was the project that kind of launched you into, into your career? Yeah. 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 I mean, I had other stuff before then. It was one little tiny movie I did. I think it was a hundred dollar movie or something, but, uh, it was by on purpose, a straight to video movie. Uh, and, uh, so I don't really count that. That didn't put, put me way ahead, I would say, but uh, as soon as I sold a perfect world, then I've been working ever since. So, um, I wanted to go back a little bit farther back for a second. Is it true that you were a PA on my, uh, my demon lover? Yes, that was my first credit. Uh, I was a PA on, um, you know, for commercials and HBO was just starting out. And so I met uh, met other PAs and met producers and things like that. And the opportunity to be a PA <clears throat> on that movie in both L.A. and New York, I took uh, I, after that, I figured I would just do PA work on commercials because it took me away from writing for too long. Right, exactly. Now, on that on that show specifically, was there anything you took away, any major lesson? Because uh, I remember doing PA work when I first started out, and I, I realized really, really early, this sucks. Um, and I don't want to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning to, to set up cones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. I had one of those. I think it was in Washington Square Park at 3 a.m., you know. When, when it was not a good neighborhood and um, yes. so you're out there trying to talk the, the crack dealers off their corners. Uh, yeah. Yeah, We're to, shooting here today. Can you move your crack dealing down a block? I would really appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, shooting in Alphabet City before it was gentrified, you know, uh, and it, there's a lot. I mean, people peeing on you from their windows and, you know. Oh, New every, York. Oh, New York. <laughs> yeah, I love New York. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like you, I decided that I, I didn't want to have a, a life in production. I knew a lot of PAs who have continued on and then they became first ADs and UPMs and things like that, but they were more cut out for it. Um, I, I liked the process, but I, I, I didn't want to have a, a life of that. Yeah, exactly. Now, uh, your first film, Hard Time Romance, which was that hundred thousand dollar straight up. Uh, how did you get that off the ground and, and how did that whole project come to, to be? Cause I mean, it is your first time yeah. on, directing on set and it is a big thing. I know it's not your big break, but it's like your first time doing it. Yeah. We, um, my theater company, one of the, one of the friends in, in our theater company was Brandon Lee, who was Bruce Lee's son sure. who tragically died on a set. Um, and who makes an appearance in the little things, but uh, we'll get to that. Later. Oh, okay. Wait a I think he does. Yeah. Okay. You'll tell me where it is. I think I remember seeing him. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, but, uh, Brandon, we were good friends and he, um, uh, would read everything I wrote and I wrote that script, which I called Via Con Dios mm -hmm. and, uh, they changed it to hard time romance. I don't know why, but, um, uh, Anyway, I wrote the script and he was dating a girl at the time who worked for a company in the Valley that did straight to video movies. And this was before DVDs, uh, before Blockbuster even, but there were video stores. And so all those video stores had empty shelves and people were really taken with the idea that they could go actually rent a movie and watch it that night and bring it back. And so uh, she smartly set up a company that would do little movies, uh, sometimes using stock footage that she would buy uh, of a car crash or something. And then, right. you know, buy, go buy the, the Nova that crashed, 
go buy a, a Nova painted the same color and you've automatically got a set piece that you don't have to pay for. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So it was, it was that kind of a, a deal. But uh, anyway, yeah, we shot in Las Cruces. And so anyway, so I, so Brandon gave the script along. Um, the producer uh, said that she wanted to do it and they were going to pay me something. I wasn't in the Writers Guild yet. I forget what they were going to pay me. Maybe it was $1,000 or something right. for the script. And uh, then they were trying to find a director. And I raised my hand and said, you know, I'd, I'd really I've been directing theater, but I'd really love to direct film. And uh, so she said, OK, but I'm not going to pay you for that. And I was like, that's fine. You don't have to. Uh, so we we cast it. It was Mariska Hargitay, one of her very first roles. Mm-hmm. Uh, friends, uh, Leon Rippey, who's a, and Tom Everett, who are character actors who have worked all the time, um, were both in it. Uh, and we went to Las Cruces, New Mexico, because we had some kind of a deal there. <laughs> and. Uh, I don't remember how many days we shot. Maybe it was 20. I don't remember. But I do remember we would routinely lose locations. So we would be at a location in an alley or something. And I'm out there with the actors trying to block the scene. And also we're using, we have a very specific amount of film. And so we're using short ends and things like that. We go, okay, this scene takes 27 seconds. Do we have enough film in, in oh. you know, to roll on this yet or yeah. not? And all those kind of things. So you really had to turn into a math problem almost every day. But you'd be out there working with the actors and here would come the producer and, who says, um, we're leaving. We're going to the next location. I said, well, what about we're going to come back to this one? And it's like, nope, it's gone. Take it out of the script. And I said, but what about all this stuff that happens in the scene that's important? Nobody will be able to make sense of this. And she goes, you'll figure it out. So, yeah, I would have to take bad exposition and, you know, kind of ham-fistedly stick it into another scene. So it turned into kind of a really bad version of days of our lives with somebody saying, remember last week when Bruce went to the hospital? <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was, that was that. Um, we finished the movie. I got locked out of the editing room oh. because I had too many, I, I had too many ideas. Uh, and then I think they let me back in at the end, but you know, it's, it's, perfectly fine i guess but no but, you know. look we all go through that we all go through those ex- those experiences i mean look i've heard so many stories just like yours like i'll do it for free uh yeah you have no control um and you're killing yourself to do it but at the end of the day you got your first movie made um and you and i promise you, i can only imagine the volumes of stuff you learned on the in those 20 days yeah uh, just every day was was learning just from the from the from the nomenclature to the way people talk on sets to uh, ways to work around problems. I mean, every day was, you know, it was me under the gun. Exactly. And that's I always I always tell filmmakers, look, throw yourself into the deep end of the pool. You are going to learn much more than in mm. the classroom. I mean, you could learn about it in, in a book all day, but until you're in the fire, um, that's when you really, really learn. True. Absolutely true. Now you you kind of started um, uh, your directing. Well, you started your career in the business really as a writer. Um, that kind of was what kind of launched you into the career. And you did this. You wrote this amazing script called The Perfect World for a little unknown director called Clint Eastwood um, at the time. Uh, how did that whole like was that a spec script? Uh, how did that work? Yeah, I um, it was just an idea I had, um, and I had a um, I'd written. Let's see. I'm trying to think exact order of how everything happened, but I, but I, I just came up with an idea for it and wrote it. I mean, I outlined it for probably six months and then wrote it very, very quickly. I had it all kind of laid out and wrote it in a real writing jag. Um, spent most of the time writing it over at uh, House of Pies and Los Feliz, uh, you know, because nobody it was before Los Feliz was really cool and hip. And so and Starbucks, I, and Starbucks wasn't around just yet. No Starbucks or somebody said it was the, the pre Beck Los Feliz uh, <laughs> and the Beastie Boys. Yeah. So, uh, you know, by seven o'clock at night, the place was empty and I could go in there and stay three or four hours and, and work and they would keep refilling my coffee cup and, and on like that. Um, but yeah, I wrote it and, um, and had, I was a pocket client of an agent 
by that point. Her name is Rhonda Gomez. Mm -hmm. And Rhonda, I gave the script to her. And at the time, I had, I had friends. I think Leon Rippey knew some people that had German money. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's all these different waves of money. This is money coming from China. It's money coming from Germany. It's money coming. And there was a wave of that happening in the late 80s. Uh, and so I met with a producer, financier, German fellow, and he seemed interested in letting me direct it. And uh, and, and, that, and I was interested in that. It wasn't, you know, either way. But Rhonda read it and she said, look, here's the thing. The German money may or may not be real. But the one thing I know is you need to get inside the walls. And this was when it was a very traditional studio system. So you need to get inside the walls. And this we, we tossed this script over the wall. And I promise you, you'll be inside magically because she said it's a really good it's a really good script. And I'm not saying it'll get made, but it'll certainly put you on people's radar. So uh, and she said, you know, and then you can you can direct something else. But let's let's just play this out. I said, OK. So she sent it to five producers over over the weekend and told them and knew them all and said to each of them, don't have this covered, read it yourself. And by Monday morning, I had five meetings set up. Um, of the five, only one, Mark Johnson, who at that time was partners with Barry Levinson in Baltimore Pictures, uh, wanted to make the movie, wanted to option it, option the script. And the others were, we love this script. Um, we're not sure we can get it made, but is there anything else you want to do? Or we've got these three books we own the rights to. Would you do you want to read them and see if there any of them interest you? So immediately I had I got work and was inside the walls. And then, you know, it started out being something that uh, it was a script. Mark we had the script and was passing it around to, to different people and stuff like that. And everybody, the word spread that it was a good script. And Steven Spielberg came up to Mark and their friends and said, I hear you've got a great script and, and you haven't sent it to me. How come? And uh, and Mark said, well, it's it's a little it has it's, there's a little bit of Sugarland Express in it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I just didn't think you'd be interested. Right. And he said, well, let me read it. And he read it. And um, so the next thing I know, Mark and I are going over to Steven Spielberg's house for lunch. And uh, so, and so, Steven. So, so, so stop right there. I just got to Yeah. Let's, let's take this slowly. What is it yeah. like? <laughs> That's a young, unknown screenwriter to be invited over to Steven Spielberg house at the height, arguably the height of his powers. Yeah. Um, well, one, the option check hadn't quite, it takes a while. I mean, yeah. they, you know, Baltimore pictured option it or got, got Warner brothers to option it for them. I can't remember what the deal was, but it takes sometimes, you know, four to six weeks to get the check. So I was still doing PA work, even though, you know, I said, no, I promise you, I optioned the script and they go, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, sure, go sure. get my coffee. Um, and, and so I had to, you know, I still had, was taking meetings and things like that around town. And I told my, I told Rhonda and my agent, I said, if you can ever make meetings lunches, that's 10 times better for me because I had a free meal out of it. Because I was really broke, wow. and uh, so she would she would try to get lunches in, uh, and uh, so anyway, Mark called and said, uh, "Do you want to have have lunch on Saturday?" And I said, "Yeah, sure. That's yes, do it." He goes, "We're going to Spielberg's house," and I went, "Oh wow!" And I'd never met Stephen, mm -hmm. and uh, so went over there. And when we got there, we got to the house and got in there, and. Um, Kate was there with some of the kids and and Stephen was out at Jack in the Box with his son, which was the weirdest thing to me, thinking about Steven Spielberg pulling through Jack in the Box. <laughs> but so he was gone and I'm there and I'm talking to Kate and she's from Texas and I'm from Texas. And so it's I, I'm getting really relaxed. It's, you know, there's kids and dogs and all that good stuff. It's just a normal great house, great, great house. Don't get me wrong. But still, it was very comfortable. And at one point. I was leaning, I was laughing and leaned back in my chair against the wall and I felt something start to fall on my head. And I go, I put my hands back up and it was kind of a loose sight in, you know, box of sorts, but it was huge. Mm -hmm. It was something mounted on the wall that was coming down and I was holding it and I turned my head around to see and it was Rosebud. 
<laughs> and I go, oh my god, no, it was not rosebud. It wasn't. Yes, I said, oh, oh my god, I you know I I almost just destroyed the most important piece of American cinema memorabilia. And um, for everyone and, listening and, who has not seen Citizen Kane, rosebud is a very important artifact out of Citizen Kane, and Steven Spielberg yeah. has purchased that rosebud. <laughs> We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Yes, Mark Johnson making a joke said they burned the door. They burned the best one. That was the second. So don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> That's amazing. But but at that time, I still had my hand up on it, and here comes Stephen in, and he. I see him, and I'm trying to hold this thing up. I look, and he goes. Pretty cool, huh? And I said, Rosebud. <laughs> it, it's, it was, so the, we were off and running from there. It was surreal, to say the least. It was, um, and Stephen said, I love your script. Um, do, what do you do in the next two weeks? Um, we, I want to go through it with you. There may be some little stuff we want to adjust, but I want to do this and do it fast because I've got another movie that I'm scheduled to do, a dinosaur movie which became Jurassic Park. Yes. But he said, I've got, I've got a start date for that, but ILM is never going to be ready. I know it's going to get pushed. So I'll have time to fit another movie in. I'd love to do this one. And I said, okay, okay. I'm, he just come over here every day and we'll work. I said, okay, that's in, that's, that works for me. Sure. And um, then, then by the end, he said, I tell you what though, let me double check with ILM, you know, just to make sure. Because if they're going to be ready, I can't push this down the road. It's It's got to start if we're ready to start. There's a lot of money behind it. I said, okay, I get it. So for about a week, I didn't hear anything. And uh, then and, and, and then Stephen came back and said, ILM said they're going to be ready. And so I have to do it. Now, at this point, it would everybody knew that there was interest from Stephen around town in this, that he wanted to do this. It could have easily become... Uh, Stephen was going to do this, but thought better of it or changed his mind. Mm -hmm. And instead, Stephen did me a solid. He kind of let everyone know that this was a movie he really, really wanted to make, but was unable to because of schedule, you know, and there's a big difference between the two. So thank you, Stephen. Um, During that time, people were sending me stuff, like I said, books and things like that. And Clint Eastwood had Warner Brothers option a book that he was interested in directing. And he said, so, you know, send it out to some writers and see if anybody's got a take on it. So they sent me the book. I don't even remember what the book was called. Um, but at the same time, they sent the script to Perfect World to Clint to read as, you know, here, here's sample. this guy, John. He's cheap. He's a sample. Yeah. And it, we can get him cheap and, you know, and, and he's not bad. So Clint read the script and goes, forget about the book. What's going on with this script? And uh, and they said, well, Stephen's, you know, going to do it. And he goes, well, if anything changes, let me know. So when Stephen called and said he couldn't do it, um, the next thing I know, I'm over at Clint's office, you know, and he we were talking about it. And he said something that made me know that he was the right guy for it when he said, tonally, it kind of reminds me of Lonely Are the Brave, which is, you know, a, a great movie, <laughs> Kirk Douglas. Um, and I and I thought, oh, he gets this. He, he gets this. So, you know, the next thing you know, you know, he's going to do it. He's got to go off and do uh, a movie with Wolfgang Peterson first before he's going to direct this. He's acting, about to start acting in a movie. In the line of fire, yeah. In the line of fire with John Malkovich. And, yeah. So anyway, we've got a little, got a little time before we're going to start. But he, um, he uh, one day he calls. And when you call, when you would call, when Clint would call, it wouldn't be an assistant on the phone saying, are you available to talk to Clint Eastwood? You know, the phone would ring and this is before cell phones. The phone would ring and you'd answer it. And he'd go, Oh, John. And go, yeah, I think it's, it's Clint. <laughs> you know, he just called. <laughs> so, um, amazing. yeah. And so he calls and he goes, uh, he goes, uh, you, 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 what he said, you're, you, you, what are you doing anything Saturday morning? And I said, um, no. And he goes, I got somebody, an actor I want you to meet. And I said, okay. And I thought for a second, I'm going to ask, I want to ask who it is, but I thought if he wanted me to know, he would tell me. So fine. So 
on Saturday, I'd been to the Warner Brothers lot several times, but I'd always been during the week when everybody was there and all the gates were open. So I knew kind of where Mel Paso was. Um, I'd, I'd never, I'd been there once to meet with Clint. Um, but they took us in on a Saturday. I had to go through an odd gate and park in a weird place. And I remember it was very warm that day. And I gave myself plenty of time to get there and park and all that. But it took so long at the gate to get through. It took, you know, then the parking and then trying to figure out where El Paso was. And no one was around to ask. Right. So I'm racing, running, sweating all over Warner Brothers lot on a Saturday trying to find El Paso. And the meeting was supposed to be at, <laughs> let's say, 10 a.m. And uh, I walked in the door at like 10 04 or something, you know, sweating and everything else. And I look in there in the lobby of Mount Paso is Clint sitting with Kevin Costner, who at the time is the biggest movie star in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just remember looking at them all sweaty and saying something my dad would always say from Texas. I said, if this isn't a dollar waiting on a dime, I don't know what is. And they, and, line. Great line. and they, and they, and they laughed. Yeah. Mike Judge actually used that because I told that story once before. And Mike Judge came up to me years later and said, I owe you an apology. And I said, why? He said, I stole one of your lines and put it in King of the Hill. And I said, oh, my dad would be so happy. So <laughs> That's a great, great line. So, yeah. So, Clint, you know, it, it, it sounds like and, you, and you're still PAing at this point. <laughs> yeah. By this point, the, the option check had had been wanted to sit down and and go through the script with me because he had he said i've got some notes right and i thought okay and and i thought you know what he's going to try to do i was my my fear was that he was going to try to soften his character who was it was named butch that he was going to make butch more lovable and nice because you know kevin's a big movie star and butch was kind of an angry dark interesting complicated guy mm -hmm. and so my fear was that kevin was going to get in and try to soften the edges on butch but the first day he said, I don't want to do anything with Butch. I love Butch. He goes, I want to build up the Texas Ranger a little bit more because I want Clint to play that role. And because at the, at the time Clint was saying, I think I'll get Robert Duvall or somebody to do it, you know, and I'll just direct it. But um, Kevin really wanted Clint in the, in the movie. And, and yeah, it's fantastic, of course. But I think more than anything, the, one of the reasons was, he wanted a poster with his with his face and Clint's face on it, you know, which is the little boy in Kevin that I that I love. He's honest about it, too. You know, it's like I just I just I just want to be in a movie with Clint Eastwood. I'm sorry. It's still. Yeah, yeah I, I've, I've had conversations with a few people who've worked with with Kevin. Um, Kevin Reynolds was on the show and we talked all about Robin Hood and Waterworld and all that stuff. And a few other directors have worked with Kevin. And he I've heard a ton of Kevin Costner stories and that so makes perfect sense. <laughs> I, I, I have a tie in with Kevin Reynolds too. Oh, how did how, was that? How, how do you get, how do you get well, that? Well, his, his dad, Herb Reynolds was the president of Baylor university where I went to college hmm. and Kevin had been in the same fraternity. I was in. he was older, but he had died, So I didn't ever know him, but I knew his baby sister who was about my age or maybe a year younger. And, uh, Rhonda Reynolds was, it's her name. And, Anyway, Kevin had gone off, and then I think he then he went out, came out to USC. He, he went to law school right, as right. well. Yeah. So he went to law school, and then decided he wanted to get into film, and uh, moved to US, went to USC grad school, and all that. And I thought, boy, there's my mentor. I, I I can see this. You know, we both went to Baylor. We both went to Baylor Law School. Um, we both are, you know, trying to make it in the film business. He's he's way ahead of me and doing great. Um, but he could be a mentor. So I sent him my sent him a script. And sent it to his agent. And then Rhonda, probably not asking Kevin, gave me Kevin's phone number and gave me Kevin's address, which she shouldn't have ever done. No, no. Uh, but she knew I was harmless. Uh, but, but still, it was a different time, too. It was it, what, what year is this? We're talking about late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. Like, yeah. To late 80s. So it, it was an, it's a little bit more innocent time. It's a bit more innocent time. <laughs> This is probably 1987. Yeah. yeah. I was I was doing PA work and I just kept, you know, and I would call his agent and leave a message of like every two or three weeks, you know, any any word back from Kevin. And <laughs> and then I would call Kevin about, you know, once a month or so and just leave a nice message. And 
one morning at like 7 a.m., I get a call, I was a call on the phone. I answer it and he says, uh, is this John? I said, yes, it is. He goes, this is Kevin Reynolds. Uh, can I buy you lunch today? And I said, absolutely. And yes. so we met at, I can't remember if it was Nate and Al's or some deli in the, in the valley or somewhere. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And we get there and I go, this is all coming together perfectly for me. I love this. I'm going to have a mentor. He's going to give me all this great advice. (laughs) And Kevin can be very precise. Kevin Reynolds. Yes. Um, um, And, and, you know, and and such a smart, smart, smart guy uh, and so talented. So I'm a little daunted, but I I, I get there and we sit down and uh, he says, we should go ahead and order just we can get that out of the way. I said, okay, great. And so, you know, he ordered, and I think I said, I'll have what he's having, you know, <laughs> just to make it easy. Right. Uh, and then um, he, he said, okay, what can I do for you? And I said, well, did you, were you able to read my script? And he said, I read 15 pages, which told me all I needed to know, with, which is you're not without talent. Um, <laughs> just what you want to hear. <laughs> yeah but you've got a lot of work to do. And I went, okay. Uh, and he said, anything else? And I said, well, you know, advice, you know? And he said, well, if I give you advice, will you take it? And I said, yes. He goes, go back to Houston and practice law. He said, because, <laughs> he said, and, and I'd also ask him about, uh, you know, mentor. And he said, it doesn't work that way. He said, you get a mentor when you've got something to add to the equation. Right. You know? And he said, it just doesn't work. Nobody, and he goes, look, nobody wants you here. You're competition. Why would I want to, you know, help, why would I want to help you? So I'm, <laughs> going, I'm going, this is the worst, this is, this is the worst lunch I've ever had. And, and he said, you know, and he said, go back to Houston practice law. He said, because here's the thing, if you'll take the advice of someone you've known for 15 minutes, you're never going to make it in this town anyway. And if you leave here after this lunch and you go, to hell with that guy. I'm going to write 10 pages today. He said, then this was a good lunch. And I went, okay. And I did, I was kind of angry, angry with him. Um, and, but I went and just wrote like hell. And so it was probably the best lunch I've ever had in Hollywood, the most productive in a way. And Kevin is exactly that. He's a very sweet man, very intelligent from, from when I, when I spoke to him and, and he, I could see that I, after knowing him for, I spoke for almost two hours. Um, yeah. I could see that lunch so clearly in my head because he is precise and he is, yes. he will tell you, and he's no BS, which I love about him. He, he yeah. will tell you, he will tell you straight up, but in many ways he was your, one of your greatest mentors without mentoring you. Yeah. And it was funny because then we're cut to years later and I'm doing a perfect world and I'm sitting, you know, <laughs> with Kevin in his office over at TIG at Warner brothers. <laughs> and, um, and he's Kevin Reynolds calls him. And he puts it on speaker because, you know, I told him I knew, knew Kevin a little bit. And, you know, so we're all friends. And I thought, well, this is really cool. He said, me putting him on speaker. And I said, yeah. I said, hi, Kevin. And, um, and he goes, hi, hi, how are you? And I said, uh, fine. Um, you know, we're, I'm here with Kevin. We're, we're, you know, working on a perfect world. It looks like it's going to go. And I thought he's going to go, man, you did it. That's so great. That's fantastic. You know, all those years back, he just went, congratulations. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> that makes that makes all the sense in the world. That makes all the sense in the world. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's great. But no, you know what? But and you know this as well as anybody in this town to get someone who's can who's candid and truthful um, is rare. yeah. It's extremely rare to find someone like that in this town. Yeah, exactly. And, it's uh, and hold it's, on. That's to true. That. No, and like I said, it was it was the, probably the most important lunch I had, had early on. You know, it wasn't what I expected, but uh, it it drove me to work harder. So after perfect after perfect world, uh, then you got another writing assignment, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, um, which was also Clint. So I'm assuming one thing led to another, and Clint hired you to do that as well. What what it, Clint didn't hire me. What happened is it was another producer on the lot, and I was looking at different stuff. Uh, to, to think about what I was going to adapt next. And they sent this book over 
that was, I can't remember if it was in Galley or it had, I mean, it hadn't been published yet, I don't think. And they had had troubles, the, the writer John Barrett had had troubles with his agent with the book because they didn't know how to sell the book. Um, they said, does it go in the travel log section? Does it go in, is it fiction? Is it not fiction? You know, what is it? And so he traded agents and found one that would help him get it, get it made. And I read the book and talked to them and, and I love the book. The book's just masterful. Um, and I, and they said, you know, it's a shame no one's ever going to really read it. And I thought, well, you know what, if we make a movie, some people will read it, I bet, you know, uh, maybe, I, but I think it's great. And, you know, like when you have a, a dense, a dense book like that, uh, with lots of interesting and colorful and complicated characters, the first thing you have to do is uh, figure out which 60% you're going to excise, you know, because it's a, it's a two hour movie, roughly. Uh, so anyway, I, I rolled up my sleeves, said yes, wrote a, wrote a draft of it that uh, the producers, the producers liked a lot. And then they were talking about different, we were talking about different directors and I ran into Clint on the lot and he said, Hey, what are you doing? What are you up to? And I said, just finished writing the script, you know, for, he goes, well, it's Warner Brothers. I could, yeah, it's Warner Brothers. He said, can I read it? And I said, sure. He goes, I'm kind of looking for something. So he read it and called me and goes, yeah, let's do this. And so he, all of a sudden it just upset the apple cart in, in a certain way because it was like everybody was going, who are we going to get to direct this? And they go, well, Clint's doing it. Um, you know, OK, great. Here we go. And uh, there we went. And he was very good to me on on both those movies because he allowed me to be on the set. And that wasn't something that he had done a lot of. Right. And his and his technique, from what I understand, I'm ever meeting him or being on set is he's that really short concise one take two take three takes tops kind of guy very laid back non he's just so comfortable i mean he's been on the set for hundreds of years yeah. at this point yeah it, it, he is i mean uh john cusack coined the the phrase for him he called him the zen daddy yeah and uh and that and that's and that's clint i mean you 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 know i try my best to to emulate kind of how his sets work in terms of I don't, I don't like, like Clint, I don't like screaming. I don't like yelling. I right. like running people running around or, you know, doing that kind of stuff. I mean, I think Clint told me one time, he goes, they don't run in hospitals and they're saving lives, you know? So <laughs> what do we have to run? From? What a great line. That's an, that's so, so, but it's so true. And you see all these, I mean, I, I can't stand working with first ADs who, who are yellers and screamers. I'm like, if you're yelling and screaming, you, you obviously don't know what you're doing in my opinion like it's enough yeah you, you should you should be able to do that job without yelling and screaming yeah it was a great and it was a great film school for me because i could just sit there and ask him questions i didn't want to bug him too much but he, he figured that i was not a writer that was going to be an obstructionist who was going to go whoa, whoa, whoa she's supposed to say and tomorrow not tomorrow you know i wasn't going to be that person right uh and then, so, so I would ask him questions, but also importantly, uh, Kevin, who had just won an Academy Award for directing as well, with Dances with Wolves, they both just won mm -hmm. in the last two or three years. So I had two Academy Award winning directors, you know, to talk to. Um, and Kevin said, at one point before we started, he said, you write like a director. And I said, that doesn't sound like a compliment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And he goes, no, I don't, I don't mean that. What I mean is you have a very strong visual sense that comes from the pages. Do you want to direct? And I said, yeah, eventually. He goes, you should direct this movie. And I said, well, we've got this Eastwood guy, and he just won an Academy Award. I think we should stick with him. Um, and, and Kevin said, no, you should prepare to direct it. You know what? You know, you know the scenes. You know, uh, you know what the call sheet says we're shooting tomorrow. If you'll come up with shot list uh, or thoughts uh, and lenses and things like that. I'll talk with you in makeup in the mornings. You bring your stuff in and we'll talk about it. And it was fascinating because, you know, I'd bring my stuff in and Kevin would go, yeah, I'm with you until here. I would do this differently or I would do that differently. And sometimes I agree with him and sometimes I didn't. And then you'd get to go watch Clint actually direct the scene and he sometimes it would be like, well, that's exactly the way I was going to do it, you know, and other times it would be it's the opposite of the way I was going to do it. But I think it's better. 
So this was such a great film school for me between those two guys being so generous. Oh my God, that must have been amazing to to basically yeah. prep an entire movie, direct it yeah. on paper, and then yeah. have two Oscar winning directors to kind of want to bounce off of and the other one to like watch them do your scene and go, Yeah. I was I was all, I wasn't on the mark on that one, but I was right on the mark on that one. He did it exactly the way I'm doing it. And it's like that must have been amazing. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And sometimes you'd look at it and go, hmm, I don't, I don't, I don't see how this is going to work the way it should. <laughs> and then you'd go to dailies right? and you would sit and you'd go, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, now I get it. Now I get it. And that's the genius of a Clint, you know? Yeah. Also, yeah. And also you, we weren't, you know, I was there by camera, by him watching this go down, but there aren't any, there aren't any monitors back, you know, right. sometimes now I'll have a clam or something where he can watch in case there needs to be a timing element or something. But back then it was just sitting and watching, um, you know, watching the camera move and everything and just watching the actor's eyes. So a lot of times, you know, I would know what lens was on, for instance, or whatever, but it wouldn't be in, until dailies when I would actually see what was being captured. Right. Um, so it was, it was, it was a great experience. Now, when you're writing, do you start with character or plot? Cause I know that's a, that's a chicken and egg scenario. A lot of screenwriters start with a plot and then fill it in with characters. A lot of people start with characters and then fill in a plot. How do you start when you're writing other than when you're adapting, obviously? Yeah. Um, I, 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 I usually kind of start with something loose plot, but very quickly thereafter, it becomes uh, about the characters and then let the characters inform the plot. I mean, with A Perfect World, it was a weird one because I had a whole bunch of scripts I was working on and different ideas for a script. And one of them was I was interested in doing a story about an older, older Texas Ranger who's about to retire. And it's the the week of the Kennedy assassination in um, Dallas. And. And, and kind of how that assassination really humbled Texas. It's like, how could this happen here? Why did it have to happen here kind of thing? Mm -hmm. And to see somebody who was probably in his younger days, more, more sure of himself. And then like a lot of us, when we get older by the, I knew that the last line of the, of the, of that movie about this Texas Ranger was going to be, I don't know nothing, not one damn thing. And that's all I knew. And so I had that one and I go, but I, I, I'm not sure what the plot is. Then I had another one that was loosely based on um, in, in, you know, there was a kid who was abducted in a, a, our small town in Texas. And, you know, so it was with guys who had broken out of prison for like three days and he was grabbed in the morning, early in the morning. So that I had that, but I didn't know what to do with it. And then I had. Growing up, I was I, we lived in I was born in Longview, Texas, in East Texas, and in second grade moved down to the Gulf Coast. But when we were Longview, when we were living in Longview, we were right next to a a field with trees and things like that. And my younger brother Joe uh, would we had we the first year we the first time we ever got store bought Halloween costumes, he got Casper the Friendly Ghost. And he wore it. I mean, he must have been four years old or something. He wore it all the way through the holidays and into the spring. And my mom finally had to cut off the sleeves to make shorts and short of it because he would wear it every day. And so I had this image of him and he would be playing by himself in the Casper the Friendly Ghost outfit running around the field. So I have a Texas Ranger at the end of his career, Casper the Friendly Ghost in a field and a, a kid who gets abducted. And these were three different things and they all just and that's what I'm saying it took a long time over the course of six or nine months of me just kind of figuring how they could blend together and so that was that was the weirdest script I've done because that's no way to no way to write a script <laughs> yeah it's th that th that's definitely the hard way to go about it without question mm -hmm. but so so it just kind of varies bit by story by story whether sometimes you'll start with character sometimes you'll start with a little plot but the loose plot is kind of where you start very loose block. Yeah, I mean, and when we, we when we talk about the little things, I can talk about that too because it's also a story I made up. Um, but it was part part plot and 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 then character. I knew that I wanted a different third act from a lot of psychological thrillers or uh, 
or serial killer movies and things like that because they had it tended to be become kind of rote paint by numbers third acts where the good guy and the bad guy face off and the good guy kills the bad guy and right. you know in heroic right. fashion and we go the first two acts were far more interesting so that was one of the ideas for that but then i i, I settled in on joe deacon pretty quickly uh, played by denzel washington and kind of knew that i wanted to write a movie about joe deacon fair enough now um your first your first feature after that that uh, indie that you did was the rookie now mm -hmm. i've seen the rookie i i don't know how many times i absolutely love the rookie i loved it when it came out and i kept watching and watching it's just one of those movies that when it's on i just watch it because it just feels so good because mm -hmm. and i and i like it more as i get older <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. like it. I like it a lot more now in my 40s than I did when I was in my 30s or even in my late 20s, which I still enjoyed it because it's just a great underdog story. How did you? Because right. that's the first jump to a major studio directorial debut. How did you jump from screenwriter to that? It's it's that's also a weird one. I mean, because I would, had movies made um, and had a deal with Warner Brothers and all that. I had different things I would pitch them and I would pitch myself as I want to direct this one. And so they make a deal. It's a writing directing deal. And, and they're probably thinking, well, you know, if the script's really, really good and we want somebody else to do it, maybe we can pay him to go away or, or maybe he'll be the right guy for it. You know? So there's, it's, they, they believed in me. The people at Warner Brothers believed in me and Clint vouched for me and said, no, he, he's, he's a director. You know, you should give him a shot sometime. Mm -hmm. um, so I was sitting there. So I had a couple of different projects that I was attached to as a writer director. And I always thought the very first thing I, the first thing, big movie that I directed would be, uh, something that I'd written just because I would have a leg up and know where all the bodies are buried and could be a little lighter on my feet. I felt, um, so anyway, and Mark Johnson, uh, who continues to be a friend and who produced the little things as well, and also produced the rookie, he was brought on to the rookie as a producer, um, along with Mark Chiardi and Gordon Gray, uh, who had initiated the project. And so Mark sent it to me and he said, would you do me a favor and read a script? He said it's, and, and Mark grew up in Spain, um, and didn't know much about Texas. He, he was like Virginia and Spain were the two places he had lived mm -hmm. in his life. And then Los Angeles, of course. But, uh, he said it, I think the script's good. But it, is it authentic? And, you know, the way that people talk and does it feel like it's uh, a New York version of what they think Texas is, you know? And, and I said, sure, I'll read it. And, you know, and, and I read it and just loved Mike Rich's script so much. Uh, and I thought, how in the world did this guy from Portland, Oregon, discover West Texas and show it off in a script in this way? And, uh, and, and it's because he did tons of research and went and spent a lot of time down there. But so I got, I called, called Mark back and I said, the script's fantastic, Mark. So don't let him screw with it. You know, it's, it's very authentic. And he goes, you know what? And you know, Mark can be very calculating and a smart producer in, in this way. He said, you know what? He goes, you've proven that you can get a job by going into a room and selling yourself as a writer. You're, you're long past that. You want to direct, you say. But you haven't proven that you can go into a room and get a job as a director. So he goes, you're not going to get this job. Because, and here's why. There was a, there was a strike. Uh, you know, everybody was saying it was going to be a strike. So we had to finish at a certain time. And they, wanted, they had a very specific low budget for it. And they said, we, we want someone who has directed before so it'll be tightly run and, and end on time and, and give us what we need. You know, because there's no international and sports movies and we have to hit this budget and, and all that. And so he said, you're not going to get the job, but I think it's worthwhile for you to go in and think about this as, as a director would and try to pitch yourself as a director. So I said, you know what, that makes that makes actually makes really good sense. So we made an appointment um, and I didn't even tell my wife, you know, that I was going in for this because I'm not getting the job. I'm, it's just something I'm doing. Yeah. So. Uh, I go in and I'm there for an hour talking about everything from what film stock I would use to lenses to, um, you know, the feeling I want from it, uh, what the music should be. Um, and, you know, and they asked really good questions and I answered honestly, because like I said, I'm not getting the job. You know, I, I can I can speak honestly. So the last thing I said was, I know I'm probably not going to get this job, 
but don't let somebody come in and script these words because Mike Rich did a beautiful job. And, uh, and they go, okay, thanks for that. And I left and then got a call, uh, from Mark Johnson who said, you're not, you know, I hope you were serious about wanting to direct it because you just got the job. And I went, what? <laughs> he goes, yeah. He said, Nina Jacobson, uh, said, I know it's the risky choice, but I don't think there's any doubt that he's the one they, they'd met with lots of directors that he's the one who gets the material better than anybody else. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And uh, so I came home and walked in and I go, I think I'm directing a movie. And she said, Brad's, which was this other project I had. And I go, no, it's called The Rookie. And she goes, what, in the, what is The Rookie? And I said, well, maybe you better read it before I say yes to this, you know, <laughs> uh, because she was pregnant at the time, too, uh, with our first kids and all that. So anyway, she read it and she said, I understand why you want to do it. And, and I think you should. So we went off and um, I got John Schwartzman. I've worked with John many, many times to be our DP. He had He had been in Michael Bay world and done a beautiful job on lots of Bay movies, but he started off doing Benny and June and wanted to get back. Yeah. He wanted to get back into being the character guy and all that and not just the big big explosion guy because he was capable of doing all of it very well. So we could get, we could afford to get John because he would cut his rate to help make him more relevant across the board as a DP and not just Michael Bay's DP. Right. And, uh, so then other people loved the script and, and came on board and, you know, then next thing you know, it's, it's getting made. And, and we were so, we we're such an inexpensive, we were the lowest budget movie of the year for Warner brothers. And they had, um, Pearl Harbor. They were dealing with Pearl Harbor, uh, in post and getting that out. They had lots of other expensive movies they were dealing with. And so they pretty much forgot about us. We went down That's to the best place to be. We went- <laughs> We went down to the desert in Texas and they forgot about us at one point after about a week because they were looking. They, yeah, I knew they would carefully watch dailies, just especially those first couple of weeks to see whether they made a horrible mistake hiring me. And after about a week, uh, somebody at the studio called John Schwartzman because they had a real great relationship with John and said, John just went through all the dailies and uh, I think they're really good. Right. And John said, yeah, they're really good. And said, so he's doing okay? And John said, yeah, leave him alone. He knows what he's doing. So they said, great. And they never bothered us again. And, the, and that's something that I found. I, and this is something that they don't tell you. This is, this is where the politics of directing come in. John, if you would have had a bad relationship with John, John could have fired you, gotten you fired off, the, off, off that set because you'd had no, no juice whatsoever. And I've been on sets before where the, the script supervisor was the mole for the producer to see if like, it can, can this guy direct? And I didn't right. realize that until like later, so like later in the time that that was, I was being watched. A lot of first time directors don't realize that they're, especially at the studio level, I can imagine you're being watched until someone vouches for you. Uh, and yeah, and that's why it's good to be friends with everybody <laughs> on the set. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's really an integral relationship, your relationship with the DP, your production designer, your costumer, you know, your production staff, your first AD. It's all, I mean, all really important relationships. But when you're talking about how you see something, I, I was not the, I was not the kind of guy who wanted to come in and go, uh, you know, give me a 17 on a, on the, on a sandbag down here and point this way. I'm, I'm, not, I'm just not that. What I'd rather do is talk about feelings. It's the same as like talking to actors. I don't tell them how to act. I just hope to say something that provokes something in them, you know, that they can do. So with John, it might be, can we be lonelier and wider, you know, and let him and, do his thing. And then, then he would say like a 17 on a sandbag and I go, yeah, that sounds great. You know, <laughs> Uh, so anyway, you know, um, we had a great relationship and, you know, we were together and this was back in the days when you would watch dailies at night, you would finish shooting. We were out in like Thorndale Mm -hmm. a lot shooting outside of Austin. And we'd drive back into Austin and go to our, um, facilities there where we would watch film dailies 
and there would be 10 or so of us and we'd have some pizza and some beer and whatever and watch dailies and really learn from them together, you know, but mostly they were just, they were really beautiful dailies. So mostly just patting each other on the back. <laughs> exactly. Uh, what, but that went to Disney. Wasn't that a Disney release? Yeah. That was a Disney. So it started at Warner's and then it just, it got sent over. To no, Disney? no, no, it was, um, it was always a Disney release. It was set up at Disney. Um, it was, um, I had a deal at Warner brothers to direct a movie, but then that one came up over at Disney. Got it. Okay. So it, it, was, it always was yeah, Disney. Yeah. It was Disney. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. And I, right. and I felt so bad because I said, I'm going off to direct a movie for your rival studio. And I had a great relationship with Warner brothers and I had a little tiny office. It was just me and an assistant, a Xerox machine mm -hmm. uh, by, by a bathroom or something. And, mm -hmm. and you know, it was no, no great shakes, but I loved it. And um, I said, I, I called Warner brothers and said, I'm about to go off and do this movie for Disney. And so I probably should clear out so you guys can get somebody else in here. And I, by that point I had, you know, 500 books in there on the walls and stuff. And they said, no, you know what? Don't worry about it. It's fine. No, there's no big push. We'll, fi we'll, fi we'll figure something out. <laughs> we'll figure something out. So then I came back from directing it and then started feeling still worse about going to the one. So I said, guys, I'm going to, I'm going to give you your office back. So anyway, <laughs> So the rookie comes out. It's a it's a fairly big hit, if I remember. It was it was it did very well at the box office. Yeah, um, and that of course, uh, when when something when something makes money in town, everybody's like, oh, you're now the new darling. Everyone wants to take you out on a dance. Everyone wants wants to date you, uh, and all that kind of good stuff. And you jumped into a fairly large project, uh, let's say, called the Alamo, uh, yeah. which was, I mean, I mean, the rookie is a very it's a small film comparatively. It's a character piece. Um, there's right. not this giant, you know, you know, extras, thousand extras and horses and all this kind of craziness. I, How did you jump from, um, uh, not only that, the budget too, that you're talking over a hundred million dollar budget at that point. How did mm -hmm. you make that jump? And how did someone, cause it's one thing to make a hit at a 20 million or $50 million budget movie. It's another thing to give somebody their second film, a hundred grand. And by the way, I had the same, I had the same question for, um, Edward Zwick. When he went from uh, all about last night to glory, and his story was fantastic, but I want to hear yours. Well, mine was um, I had a good time with Disney, and Disney really loved the rookie, and it did well at the box office and made money for him and all that. And they had set up um, the Alamo there. Uh, at the time, it was just called Alamo, um, and it was originally a script by Les Boheme, who's who's a friend of mine, and. Um, and it had gone through rewrites um, and Ron Howard was attached. And it, the first thing that happened was Ron Howard, who I knew, had, you know, some we had met several times and I like Ron a lot. And um, he called and he said, would you do me a favor? And, and we I mean, I've looked at his movies and he's looked at my movies and he's, he, you know, you, you try to help each other out, you know, since then. But um he uh, he called and said, would you read a script for me? Because I know you're from Texas and and I just want I just I would just love your read on it because I'm not sure how to wrap my arms around this one. And so I read it and we had, you know, some discussions about it and, you know, stuff that I said, I think you might push this a little bit more, or lean into this a little bit more and and some of those kind of things. And um, he said, OK, thanks. And then they had a falling out at Disney over the rating. Um, and Russell Crowe was, was loosely attached uh, at that point. Uh, and uh, he was going to play Sam Houston. And so uh, then, then what happened was it was going to be R rated. And then Disney said, it's such an expensive movie. It was like a hundred million dollar movie that we can't afford to leave all that business behind. We need this to be PG 13. And so Ron, you know, said, well, I kind of, if I'm going to do this, I kind of want to do an R rated movie. And, and I think he actually in his head was thinking, I'm not sure I want to do this movie anyway. He had another one called uh, the missing, I believe with Tommy Lee Jones and Kate Blanchett that he did instead. But, um, but he stayed on as a producer uh, when Disney came to me and said, Dick Cook came to me and said, would you consider doing the Alamo? Because at this point, they already had 
started building sets. Um, and, you know, it was something like 60 acres of sets in the hill country outside of Austin. I mean, this is like the way they used to do it in the olden days. This is no VFX, you know, really. It's, it's, these are actual buildings that Michael Kornbluth, our, our brilliant production designer, designed and laid in. And then there was waterways he had to create and all this stuff. Anyway, uh, so they asked, you know, if I'd be interested. And I, and I said, yeah, but I need to do a rewrite on the script. I mean, I, I am interested. I'm intrigued. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And they said, would you, so we had a couple of discussions about that. And then they, uh, they, they said, would you go down and we have a production designer and we have a costume. We're already on the show. been working for many, many, many months. Um, could you go down and see what they've done? And of course you can bring your own people in or whatever, but just, you know, go see what they've done. And, and I said, yeah, I'm interested in directing this. Ron called and he said, the only thing I would ask is that you, you absolutely have the right to bring your own people in, but go look at what they've done first, just to see. And then, then you know, then get rid of them and hire, hire who you want, but just go see what they've done. So I went down to Austin and went out and saw those brilliant sets being built and all the progress and then went to the warehouses and warehouses filled with, um, with Mexican army uniforms and swords and scabbards and blah, 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 blah. then went to the ranch where all the horses were that we had bought for the movie. And it was just, I was a kid in a candy store. And so one, I cer certainly wanted Michael and Daniel to stay on if they would. And two, then I sat down to do uh, a pretty extensive rewrite on it to make it the story that I, I kind of wanted to tell. Um, and Disney was, was great. I mean, they were great every, every, every step of the way. Um, and they were, and they were lovely in post too, but I would say shooting the movie was as much fun as you can have. I mean, it's daunting. Yeah. Um, you know, you're, you're driving, you're driving out to the set and you see 50 trucks. And then some days we go, we've got, uh, you know, 2000 extras today. They had started getting dressed at 1 a.m. just so they could move them all through. And, you know, there were days when I think we fed 3000 people um, and it's it's daunting, but it's also it feeds your ego in, in a kind of a good way to say, I, I'm up for this. I can do this, you know, and uh, and had a blast making the movie. And then we had a very short I mean, something Clint had told me that I didn't listen to was he said, he told me when I was about to go off and do it, he said, just make sure you've got plenty of time in post. Um, he said, when you, and by that, I mean, not only the number of days in post, but make sure you're not driving toward a release date because you just, you want to make sure that the movie can be the movie it wants to be. And then you, after you do that, then you decide when you're going to release it. And it was scheduled for a Christmas release, Christmas day release. And I essentially had, less time on that movie in post or close to the same amount of time as the rookie. And, you know, the, just the footage alone, going, going through the footage is, oh, man. Slightly, slightly of, different in, in coverage. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, so, yeah. And so we were racing, racing. And to meet the Christmas deadline, we needed to start having previews. And so I, I had a cut of the movie that was – um, a little, a, a, a little, a little long, probably, you know, but I still, I hadn't finished editing yet. And I said, well, let's put it together and then we'll learn from the preview thinking, yeah, it's not going to preview through the roof because historical epics never do. Um, and anyway, so we had that first preview and I said, this will help me know what 15 minutes I want to cut out and where it's going to feel slow and all that stuff. And we tested, and I believe we tested a, 69, which for a historical epic is not bad. Uh, and I think Master and Commander had tested within those two weeks as well. And it tested similarly to it. But, you know, Tom Rothman looked at that number and said, well, it's a historical epic. It's, I think it's a great movie. It's keep going, keep going, keep going. And Disney coming off, you know, my, my success with the rookie was thinking, how come we're not in the 90s? You know, and we were like, well, you're never going to get the 90s with this. You know, it was supposed to be an ambiguous ending. I mean, Texas was born through 
through blood and it's some of it's heroic and some of it's definitely not heroic. Mm -hmm. It's a, I mean, it's a story of a Mexican civil war is what it is. It's, it's not, it's not jingoistic patriotism, which I think in some ways Disney was hoping for and counting on, you know, (laughs) and maybe they didn't read my script, but, (laughs) uh, but again, they were completely kind and tried to be helpful, but it was just post was a nightmare. I learned a lot from that, which is trust your gut. And um, yeah, I, I just find it fascinating jumping from something like The Rookie um, to um, something like The Alamo, which is so much more massive. And I mean, on the set, like you were talking, like you're driving by and there's 50 trucks and you're feeding 3,000 people. I imagine that there's a certain amount of stress and pressure that you feel. And you feel that stress and pressure on your, I'm assuming you felt that same stress and pressure on those days uh, doing your first feature. Um, different stress and pressure because this was your first time when you're at that level, how do you process that kind of pressure? Because you literally have a hundred million dollar plus budget on your, on your, on your shoulders, plus the PNA, that's going to be another 50 million or whatever it is now, probably more than the budget itself for PNA and these kind of mm-hmm. giant movies. How do you deal with that? And how does that, how do you not only deal with it, block it, from the creative process, because I can imagine that pressure can just collapse on you and just hurt right. the creative process. And I've seen that happen. We all seen that happen throughout history to some directors under that pressure. You can see the movie just suffers uh, because it just couldn't deal with it. How did you deal with it? Well, I, I think because it was, it, I was early in my career as a director, I didn't think about it too much. I mean, <laughs> ignorance probably, is bliss. Ignorance is bliss. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I didn't consider, I knew it was an expensive movie. I knew I didn't want to waste Disney's money. Um, but to their credit, they never were constantly reminding me either. You know, they just do the work, do the work, do the work. And, you know, our schedule was sufficient to the task. And, you know, it was always about making it the very best it can be. And, um, and, a, and a great crew and great actors and all that good stuff. So I didn't think about it too much until, it, until post, probably. <laughs> But more than anything, I mean, it's the same if you're doing Viacondias or The Rookie or The Alamo. I mean, the sun comes up, the sun goes down. And this, these are the hours you have to you have to capture what you need to capture. Mm-hmm. Um, and the rules are the same. So, you know, you you have common traits with, you know, the, the person doing a student film. You know, they've got the, the same limitations. They've got a budget. They've got uh, rentals on their camera. Uh, the sun comes up, the sun goes down. It's simple. So don't you, basically the, for ignorance was bliss and you didn't think about it too much till you actually sat down and started watching this footage. And you're like, holy crap, this is a big movie. Uh- <laughs> well, I, I knew it was, I knew it was I know, big. <laughs> it was one of those things where it's like on the set, it would be, I mean, when we had like the storming of the North wall and we shot that for gosh, so many days, mm-hmm. probably maybe two or three weeks or something. Cause there were lots of little intricate details. But it was just so fabulous because we'd be out there at night and I would talk to we had all our historians and stuff. OK, the Toluca Battalion, they're going to be coming from the from the northwest here. Then they're folding in the cannon back there. Da, da, da. And we would block this. It would, would block it until lunch, right. you know, in the middle of the night. And we'd say, OK, now we now we've got what we were going to do. We've got 12 cameras capturing this. Some of them are in ditches. Some of them are hidden here. We've got a big dolly. We've got a hundred, you know, 155 feet of dolly track that's undulating and going up and down, and all this stuff. And so we get it all set, and then we do. We come. We go to lunch. We come back after lunch, and sometimes before lunch, we would just do a let's do a quarter speed. You know, you're not running full blast. You're just jogging so that we can start to time out the dollies and look at the lens and help help the operators out. And I think there was there were certain days we had 12 cameras and all the monitors set up. And it was like you felt like you were directing Monday Night Football. It was like you'd have to watch them all back. So anyway, go after C, lunch, go to A, go to F, go to D. <laughs> right. them because, you know, you know, the sweet spot for like where it's coming to the place where the guy's going to fall in the ditch on the camera. And there it is. <laughs> um, but it was a blast. And so we'd come back after lunch and go, OK, let's give it a shot. And we would just do the whole thing and then, you know, run out of film and say, okay, let's reset the squibs. Let's do all the stuff. We'll go one more time. And you, so you do two takes of it and it it takes all day long and you get great stuff. And then what you do is that, then what you do is, you know, the next day you come in and go, okay, now we got to 
be more precise about this and this and this and this, and you start breaking it up into pieces. I mean, you know, making a film is a little like uh, a giant mosaic. Um, because on the day you go, there's a blue tile and there's a green tile and here's a white tile and I need more yellow here. And you're right up next to it, attaching all these. And it's not until you're able to step back and see it. You go, oh, I see what it is now. So it's it's the difficult but the fun part of directing is that you have to keep your head down on today's work, but also keep checking the horizon to make sure you go in the right direction. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Right. Because sometimes you're, 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 you you keep your head down to like, oh, my God, where am I? I'm in Toledo when I really yeah. wanted to be in Vegas. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> now, after after the Alamo, um, you took a little bit of a break. You took like about five year break in your career uh, or at least three years, at least from the release to release. Yeah. Um, and then uh, that little film called Blindside, the Blindside mm -hmm. shows up. How did you get involved with that film and, uh, and, and that whole story? It was, you know, after the Alamo, I was beat. It was a long process and it had taken its toll on me sure. uh, emotionally, physically, everything. Um, I also had small children. So I thought, I don't want to go and shoot, do another hundred day shoot somewhere. You know, not that anybody was calling me to beg me to do it, but I'm just, just saying, I don't, I know I don't want that. Um, and I was also writing a lot. And so I was getting jobs writing and was able to stay home and be with the kids and all that. So, um, at some point when I did the blind side, um, there's a writer from the LA times, Patrick Goldstein, uh, it contacted me and said, um, so you were in, so you've been in director jail for three years. And I go, I didn't know, really. I said, because I was still getting I was still getting offers to direct stuff. But it was just nothing that I wanted to do. And and I said, I didn't know. I guess it's I'm glad again. Ignorance is bliss. I was just writing and working. And it's not like I wasn't making money and all that and right. staying home. And so and just, and just so but, everyone's clear, Alamo wasn't uh, Alamo wasn't a, a, a blockbuster. Um, it didn't no. do it. It didn't do well at the box office. So that's why no. you were. That's why they considered you in in block, in, in director jail. Yeah. And we've all heard. I've heard of director jail when I talked to Kevin about yeah. uh, Waterworld. He was like, I I understand. Like I mean, you, there is the, there is a thing called director jail, and you do get kind of put yeah. into that for a little bit. But you had the blessings of being a writer, so you can constantly be writing as well. And I'd always wanted to. I'd never been a person and still haven't been who wants to go movie to movie to movie to movie. I mean, I'm not, I'm not Tony Scott. Who's going to be in post on one and prep in another, you know, rest in peace, Tony, I love yes. Tony. Um, but he was, that's what Tony did. It was just keep going, keep going, keep going. And I like to recharge and write and think about stuff and figure out what I want to do next because it's two years of your life. Um, and it, you know, I don't like to wake up at four in the morning. Um, so if I'm going to choose, it's got to be something that I'm going to be invested and interested in for two years. And so sometimes it's hard to find those things because some things you go, this is a great script. I'm not sure I'm the right person for it. And I think I would get bored with it after nine months. Um, so anyway, one of the things that came to me, um, was a, a producer named Gil Netter had secured the rights to Michael Lewis's book, The Blind Side. And I'm, I'm a big Michael Lewis fan and, you know, read everything he writes and he's, he's fantastic. Uh, and I was, you know, and so I was going to get the book and read it anyway. It's Michael Lewis. And uh, the call came, would you like to read, you know, read, read the book? And, you know, they wanted to gauge my interest in, in adapting and directing it. And uh, so I thought, well, yeah, I'll read it. I'm going to read the book anyway. I'm, I don't want to do another sports movie, though. I said, I just don't want to do that. Um, I had talked to Ron Shelton once and we were on a panel together after the rookie and baseball movies and all that, you know, and he said, okay, you made it out unscathed. The movie's great. Don't ever do another sports movie. I said, what, what? He goes, no, nah, man, you get, it's a rut that nobody thinks I can do anything with sports movies now. So he goes, just be, be cautious, be careful. Mm -hmm. And so here comes, I'm, I'm not going to do another sports movie. But I read it and about halfway through, I go, I've got a 
I've got a specific take on this, and I think I think I've cracked it. They're probably going to disagree. It was over at Fox. Um, so fine, I'll go have a meeting. I went to have a meeting. I love the book. Went to have a meeting, pitched an unconventional mother-son story, and um, they, you know, eventually they said, yeah, we want you to do it. So we had meetings and meetings and meetings and meetings and talking about it. And then I wrote the script, and it became, and everybody loved the script. Um, but it became obvious that something happened along the way there. When I first finished it, Julia Roberts was in, very interested in it. And Fox was desperate to be in business with Julia Roberts. So it, it might as well have not been called The Blind Side, but instead you know, Untitled Julia Roberts Project. Um, and I met with Julia, who was awesome. Um, and we had several meetings about it, and she was interested. And then finally, she got to a point, she said, I'm not sure my head's in this. And you need to make this movie because the script's great. And she said, I feel a little bit of Aaron Brockovich in it. And I don't want to I don't want to do that to this character or to your movie. And and she also had small kids and you know all that. And so I got it completely. So she was out. And at that point, Fox became less interested in the movie. Um, and it was obvious they weren't going to make it. And and uh, so Alcon. Um, I knew the guys at Alcon because Mark Johnson and I produced, uh, along with Jay Russell, uh, My Dog Skip, uh, film. which, film. which was out one of Alcon's first, maybe maybe their first movie, and it made money. We made it for four million dollars or something, you know. Uh, so it made money and continues to make money. That it's the little dog that could. Um, but uh, so I knew them, and they read the script and loved it, uh, and uh, they said, if you can get it out of Fox we'll do it. And so we negotiated um, a very strict turnaround situation from Fox where we had to be in production on this certain day or it reverted to Fox, back to Fox, who was thinking about, they were thinking, well, there are more men in their 40s that will make this movie with than women in their 40s that will make this movie with. So they said, make it a father-son story instead of a mother-son story. And I said, that's, it's, it's not the truth. It's not the book. You know, it's, you know, and Leanne Tui would fly here and kick your ass. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, thankfully, we, we got it up and running very, very quickly. And, uh, you know, and then Sandy was in and it, you know, that was great. It was, it was a great experience making the movie. It was nice, nice to be on a set again. We were in Atlanta. Um, I was loving it. I had no idea. I thought it had commercial instincts mm -hmm. and potential, but you never know, you know, how's this all going to come together. I knew that I thought Sandy had essentially just kind of taken over <laughs> Lee and Tui. Uh, she talked like her, she walked like her, she wore her clothes, um, the watches, everything, the rings, they were all, you know, based on Leanne's actual stuff. And uh, she had Leanne read the script for her out loud just so she could have the cadence and Leanne did all the lines and, and all that kind of stuff. So it was, uh, but it was a great experience. And then, you know, we had our little movie and it tested through the roof and it was a crowd pleasing kind of feel good movie. So it needed to mm -hmm. Warner brothers opened it wide. And that first weekend, I remember it was Thanksgiving. Um, it opened, like on Thanksgiving day or the day before Thanksgiving or whatever. So we had a long extended weekend through Thanksgiving weekend and the studios would come out with their projections. You know, um, every studio would make the projections on their movies and other movies around town that were passed around by a guy named Jeff Blake. And so Warner brother, um, like Fox said the projection for, the blind side is $12 million. I'm making that up, but it was something like that, mm -hmm. which would have been for our budget would have been made it a success. Mm -hmm. But, um, and then somebody else, I think it was Sony maybe said 15. And then Warner brothers came out with their projection and it was 20. And the thing is what studios do is they don't puff up their own movies. They would rather project low mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and not get people too overly excited. So my agent, uh, David O'Connor, at that time, when he saw the projection from Warner Brothers at 20, he said, they think it's going to do 25 or they wouldn't have put 20. 
Wow. And, and no, it's and, and the other thing was we opened, we were supposed to open originally this, the following spring, but a slot opened up with Warner Brothers um, and it was going to be going opposite. Um, oh, gosh, what is the vampire? Um, oh, one of the Twilight first, series? Yeah, twi- twi- the first Twilight. Oh, you know, I, so they said, do you want to open against that? And I was like, well, we're not going to win the weekend. It doesn't matter on our budget. And um, so uh, we um, we went into that. The reports were good. The reports were good. I was hoping that, you know, at least the minimal would be Fox Fox's projection of 12. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Uh, and it did 34 million. Oh, no, it's a monster hit. It was a and then it, gigantic hit. It just never went away. Six different times it outperformed its previous weekend during its run, which is – I'd never heard of. It's staggering. I remember that with like Home Alone. Like Home Alone came out and then like it kept growing and people were like, what? And Titanic. It kept growing. Well, You're like, what the heck's happening? No, no. Blindside was an absolute smash hit. And then you get an Oscar nomination and then and then Sandra wins the, the Oscar for it. And uh, it must have been – you must have been on cloud nine during those times. I, I was and it was one of those ones because there was no expectation with it. I thought it was right. a, a nice movie and a good story. And it, I thought this has commercial instincts. We'll see. Um, and and then it never we never talked about awards or anything like that. It was just the movie. It's a sports movie. Sports movies generally don't. Yeah, yeah. Generally don't get that kind of reaction. Then, and there was no like press stuff going on for it. No push for anything uh, for awards. And I remember at Alcon and at Warner Brothers, they said, "You know what we." I, everybody's talking about Sandy Bullock. Like, she, you know, she might get a nomination. We should probably put some bucks into like, pushing this a little bit. Right. And so I remember the first thing was a cocktail and hors d'oeuvres party uh, just for Sandy. You know, and it was all press people and stuff. And it was, and people were over the moon for, you know, for the movie and for her performance. And, and then it was just by surprise, all of a sudden it was like, how did this happen? You just get swept along, you know, and you go, wow, this was kind of great. And I told my wife, I said, none of this will ever happen again. You know, the, the idea of this movie making this much money coming out of nowhere and coming out of nowhere for, a, for an award season that are so calculated. I mean, award season is like months, 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 months of preparation and laying the foundation to, to leap at the right time and get nominations. And this just happened. Yeah, it, it is a once in a career <clears throat> kind of situation to say the least um your two next films which are uh, saving mr banks and the founder you tackle again real life um characters and stories mm-hmm. um with with tackling uh saving mr banks like walt disney must have been daunting just to to, to portray i mean and you're working with tom hanks and emma tom uh, yeah. and emma and, and and it just must have been uh amazing how did you like approach trying to bring Walt Disney to the screen with Tom. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. The first thing was that, you know, the script, Kelly Marcel's script was fantastic. Um, And even though I'm not a huge fan of Mary Poppins or musicals or any of that kind of stuff, I was just really drawn to the, the father daughter aspect of PL Travers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, 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 and the fact that it was her movie and this was just two weeks in the life of Walt Disney, really, you know? Right. Uh, so I think I didn't think about it that much, but you know, the first thing that came, first name that came to mind, of course, was Tom Hanks. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and then, you know, we, they, we cast Emma first, um, and then Emma was there and she's great and perfect for it. And then everybody started talking around town about it and Tom, you know, wanted to meet. And so we met and, uh, you know, I was prepared for tons of different questions and things like that, or, cause that's a daunting task for, for him. You know, Walt Disney's never, never been played. Right. Exactly. And then if there is anybody that could pull it off, it, it's yeah. next. <laughs> you want someone, you want someone who is, I wanted an, I wanted and needed an icon playing an icon. Absolutely. Yeah. You can't and, get an unknown for that. No. Yeah. And he, all he said to me was, all the stuff in the script that shows me smoking 
and shows me, uh, you know, that I have my scotch at five o'clock and I, I curse a couple of times and uh, I curse a couple of times. Just make sure that just tell me, is that going to stay in the script? Because I'm really drawn to this. I'm, I'm drawn to Walt Disney as a human being, not an icon. And I said, yeah, it's going to stay in or I'm out, too. And he, so he said, let's shake on it. So we shook on it. And he said, OK, let's do it. That was it. It was like a 10 minute meeting. That's <laughs> um, yeah. And it was wonderful. That was so much fun. We had so much fun making that movie. Uh, and the movie turned out, turned out, turned out great. I'm very proud of it. And then wonderful. The, the founder was also one where the script came, came to my desk and I read it and really liked it, but I thought, you know, I've already done all these real life characters, but I, felt like that nobody really knew or looked at Ray Kroc the way they did at Walt Disney or something, right. you know? Right. Um, and there was also something about the script that uh, Rob Siegel wrote it. And it was beautiful. Uh, where, where I was pulling for this guy in the first half of the movie and then actively rooting against him. And I thought that's an unusual high wire act to try to pull off. Right. Um, and in the, in the first person that popped in my brain was Michael Keaton, you know, cause there's, some similarity in, you know, how he and Croc look and all that. Uh, but just he, he's Michael's a great salesman. And I mean that is in the nicest possible way. There's something about him. There's an energy that he's selling you, whether it's he's telling you a joke or whether he's talking about a movie. There's an enthusiasm there that I thought, man, he is he is he's this guy, he's this guy. And, and he wanted to make sure that it was a warts and all portrayal. He said, we're not going to shine him up at the end. And I go, no, 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 not at all. I want, you know, he said, but I want to be true to him. I want to be true. I want to uh, make sure that we under, everybody understands what a complicated individual he is. He said, because there are things about Ray Kroc that I greatly admire. I mean, everybody said, even his enemies, they never met anyone who worked harder. And how he was, was a, he when, and how he was like in his mid fifties, right? When he launched started. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was at an age in his early 50s, maybe 54. I can't remember now where all his friends were retiring because this was back then, you know, you retired at 55 mm -hmm. and he felt like that he had had some success in business, but it never really rung the bell. He, he had not that one thing. And he thought, why not me? How come not me? I work harder than everybody. I have these ideas. I, you know, I push them. The multi mixer, the folding up table, that he's just trying. He's just hustling, hustling, hustling. And I love that about Ray Kroc. But uh but yeah, I mean in the and then, so anyway, I, I I liked it and uh you know, we did did a little rewriting on it and um, Michael said yes and we it was a little tiny movie we did and I, I love that movie. Yeah, and I love I, I always love characters or I love movies where the villain turns into the hero or the hero turns into the villain or or they jump back and forth. It just makes it so much more interesting to watch. Because you're right, Ray, you you're rooting for him at the beginning, but towards the end you're like, he's destroying these the, the McDonald brothers. Like he's like stealing it's, this yeah. from them. It's under from I, literally I, under their feet. <laughs> yeah. You know, I always thought of it as death of a salesman with a very different ending. <laughs> Willie Loman takes over the world. <laughs> right, that's essentially it. It was, it was, it was a remarkable, uh, remarkable film. Now, your latest film, um, the Little Things. I mean, you've got three, arguably three of the most powerhouse actors uh, in ho working Hollywood today: Denzel, Jared, and um, oh God, I always forget his first name. Rami. Rami, thank you, Rami. Um, who are just these powerhouses? I, I have to ask you, um, how do you direct three? just powerhouse actors in one scene because there's a couple of times in the movie that all three of them are together um yeah how do you direct those scenes because you got three are they all same schools as far as acting are concerned is one more method no because I, I heard denzel's much more method or less no he's less method but there's just like different styles how do you direct that i think i mean every actor is different I mean, in, in some way, in some way, every actor is method and that they have a method to get them to the character that they need to play. Right. Um, in terms of it being method, Jared's probably more traditionally what we think of in that he stays in character. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have read throughs or rehearsals with Jared and Rami and Denzel where they met in real life. When they met Albert Sparma, played by Jared, he was Albert Sparma. And when Albert Sparma saw, saw, uh, saw, you know, had a scene with Denzel, it was not Denzel, it was Joe Deacon. 
And so that just elect, electrifies everything. Um, uh, but all, every one of them, is, every one of them is different. I mean, it's just, and you kind of have. It's in some ways, being a director is like being a really good coach. I mean, I think I learned more about directing from having had some good coaches. Where you've got a locker room of people that all have different interests. Some of them don't necessarily get along, but they have to unify for a period of time, you know, to to, to go and accomplish the goal. And and some of them. And, you know, and, and some athletes need praise and some need challenges and some need, you know, but these two guys, obviously, there's, you know, it's just a, it's just a conversation. I mean, they're, they're all just they're juggernauts. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So, so, I mean, I just love watching them all act. So it, for me, it wasn't about maneuvering them in any way, one way or the other. It's just, we'd already talked about everything. We had, yeah. I mean, I spent a lot of time in prep with those guys. So it's, I imagine watching like Emma and Tom working on saving, Pri- on uh, saving Mr. Banks and watching these guys on, on, you must just have like, as, as the little boy in you who wanted to be that director must be sitting mm-hmm. there like, like this going, this is awesome. I remember one day early on, um, my, my old friend, uh, Bradley Whitford, who's also in the movie came up to me and he goes, man, you're directing Tom Hanks. How cool is that? <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty darn cool. Like Clint, like yeah. uh, Kevin Costner's like, I just want a poster with Clint Eastwood at it. Like the little boy. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I, I need Clint Eastwood yeah. in this movie. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, yeah. Exactly. And, and, you know, and just those guys too, sometimes it was just, you'd forget to yell cut. And that was the same with the little things. I would just, you know, we did go on and on. I'm just watching Denzel work or Jared or Rami work and the scene's over and I'm just letting it roll. And Denzel goes, anything else? <laughs> you know? And I go, no, man, I just, I just love watching you act. So <laughs> just, just enjoying the ride, Denzel, just join the ride. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Now, I'm going to ask you a few questions, ask all my guests um, some quick questions. Um, what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? I say knowing what you want and then presenting it to the world is knowing what you want is one thing. Announcing it to the world is a harder thing because when you're starting out, you can say somebody said, might say, I want to I want to direct movies and they know it in their head, but they don't they don't prepared or ready to answer, uh, announce it to the world because they'll be scoffed at or they'll be, you know, yeah, right. Or whatever. And we're all fragile. Um, so I would say knowing precisely what you want, uh, and then announcing it to the world, I would say John sales told me many, many, many years ago, he said, if you want to be a writer, write. If you want to be a director, direct. He goes, that was what I did, you know, back in New Jersey or wherever it was. He said, you know, if I wanted to write, I would write something or somebody else would write something or whatever. I'd write something and then I'd get my friends who were actors. And then I would say, OK, we're going to do this in my living room, you know, but I would be directing. And he said, it's just that's vitally important not to wait around for someone to go. Yeah, you uh, who, who really haven't directed, you should direct this movie um, because it just it doesn't doesn't happen. Um, so yeah, I would say do, you know, you've got to, you've got to, if it's the thing that you would do for free, then you're in the right business. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's gotta be a hobby that you hope to make a living at something that you love so much you do for free. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Hmm. Hmm. That's a good question. Uh, don't talk so much. <laughs> you know? yes. um, I, ha- I sometimes have a tendency, as you have you've seen over the last hour and a half, to uh, <laughs> just flap my gums too much, and I should, you know, I should listen more. And I try to remind myself to listen more, uh, especially in conversations with with actors, and when you're working on a movie, or you know, someone's reading your script for you. Um, you know, to give you notes on it. It's, it's, and also to ask more questions, not just go, yeah, yeah, I like that too. And here's why yeah. it'd be like, 
did it seem this to you? Did it seem that to you? I mean, asking questions and listening to answers, I think is, is you get, you get further ahead that way than yapping on like I do. And last question, three of your favorite films of all time. Mm. Well, that's a rotating list. Mm -hmm. It depends on your mood. It depends on what you're in the mood for. On the day. On the day. On the day. Um, I really love, I named my, my corporation, uh, after a line of dialogue from Badlands, so I'll throw Bat Terrence Malick Badlands in there. Um, I love, love, love the conversation, which is my favorite Coppola film. Um, uh, let's see, gosh, a third one. Um, mm, man, so many, so many. Love, Lonely Are the Brave, love uh, The Conformist, Bertolucci's The Conformist, um, love the whole the whole run of Michael Ritchie uh, movies. The Candidate is, I think, a brilliant movie because it started out as satire and now we look at it and it's, it was just present, you know. It was a documentary. It's, it's a documentary now, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but John, listen. But yeah, that's a lot, but yeah, those are a few. It has been an absolute pleasure talking to you this uh, this this last ninety minutes. I truly truly appreciate um, uh, you taking the time and and sharing uh, sharing your journey with the, with filmmakers of the of our tribe and and hopefully this will continue to inspire some people down the line. So you have uh, been making some really great movies over your career. I, I hope you can continue to make many many more in the future. So thank you so much, sir. Me too. Thanks for having me, Alex. I appreciate it. I want to thank John for coming on the show and dropping those knowledge bombs on the tribe today. Thank you so, so much, John. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, please head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 451. And guys, if you haven't already, head over to IFHAcademy.com and check out our new courses that we've got lined up for you to help you on your filmmaking journey. Head over to IFHAcademy.com. Thank you again for listening, guys. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. Stay safe out there, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 